And welcome to Healing X Outreach. I'm your host, Augusta Nastasio. Still haven't quite gotten over this uh, laryngitis kind of flu bug thing. You can hear my voice is still a little bit raspy. I'm getting better and better every day. But um, we are here, and um, we're here for a really uh, great debate. I uh, just want to thank everyone for listening. If you're trying to listen in onto the program, there's several ways you can listen in. First of all, there is a video suite. And uh, at the video suite, just go to www.sixscreensofthewatchtower.com backslash telenetwork backslash telenetwork dash directions dot php, and that will take you to the video suite. And you can see me there on the video suite hosting the program. Maybe next time we have our, our guests for debate, we'll invite them to come onto the video suite. The other two other ways that you can listen, actually three other ways you can listen to today's debate is by the Six Screens Tele Network hotline number. That is the 712-432-8710 number. And then when prompted, dial 9925 so that you can listen to the debate through that number. And we are in cooperation with the Six Screens Tele Network. So um, uh, this is why we have all these available ways you can listen to the program today. The other way you can listen to today's program is through the Blog Talk Radio Hotline number. That number is 347-934-0379. And when prompted uh, to be invited to go ahead and participate in today's Q&A section, we'll ask you to press 1 so that you can be unmuted and get involved in the question and answer section of today's debate. And then lastly but not least, the other way is by the uh, advertised URL number, I mean URL uh, address given uh, via the internet. You can listen live there or on iTunes, where we are also listed on iTunes. And if you are on iTunes, we invite you please to share some comments about our program so that we can get boosted up on the Google pages there when people try to Google for Healing X Outreach Internet Radio. Uh, all of our uh, all of our programming is in an archives, and you can check out our archives for all the programs at www.blogtalkradio.com backslash healing, the letter X, and outreach. Today's debate, we have two debaters. We're just uh, very, really privileged to go ahead and have these two men here to go ahead and choose this forum for their debate. One is Dan Barker. Dan Barker served as a Christian preacher for 19 years, but left Christianity in 1984. He is the co-president of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. He is the co-host of Free Thought Radio. He has lectured and debated on many college campuses. He's a jazz pianist and writer whose works are Beware of Dogma, Friendly Neighborhood Atheist, and Adrift on a Star. And his books include Godless, Life-Driven Purpose, God, the Most Unpleasant Character in All Fiction, whose forward is by the very famous atheist and author, Richard Dawkins, who wrote The God Delusion. Our other debater is William Alberts, who has a PA in theology. He's a member of the Catholic Legate, and you can find out more about him at catholicgate.com or at YouTube on his YouTube page, which is youtube.com backslash GNRhead or on godtube.com backslash catholic backslash. So let's go ahead and see if our debaters are here online. I see two people who have pressed the one. 830. I am here. This is William. Okay, that's William Albrecht. And I would assume 479. Is that you, Mr. Barker? That's me. Good afternoon. This is Dan. Hi, good How afternoon. How are you doing, thank Dan? You. So I want to thank you both for choosing this forum to go ahead and have your debate, which will be available instantly after the debate is over by the advertised URL. You can just check it up on our archive page. If you want to use it, just go ahead and take that URL. You can use it and post it on any page for both of your purposes. The rules of the debate, of course, are we have two seven-minute openings, two five-minute rebuttals, six six-minute cross-exams, two seven-minute closings, and then we take 24 minutes for the Q&A. And I just want you guys to uh, be familiar with the sign that time is running at an end. And it will be this ring. Hold on. Let me go ahead and get the ring here. 
this is the ring to listen for. This will mean that the time is running out of them. And uh, you don't have to be abrupt about ending. Just go ahead and finish your thought as soon as you could. And this is the ring right here. <clears throat> so that's a pretty long ring. It gives you plenty of time to go ahead and uh, finish <laughs> that's, that's your thought. Pretty, that's pretty good. Okay. So, um, Who's going to go ahead and have the first opening? I would take someone. I, I believe that. I believe I'm going to be opening since I'm going to be uh, making the affirmative for the case, and I believe yeah, Dan will be closing now. I, I think we made that agreement, right, Dan? Yeah, I'd open it. You close. Yeah, I, I don't think he announced the topic of the debate yet either. Oh yes. Oh, uh, the debate is right. Jesus rise from the dead. <laughs> Thank you for doing that for me, Dan. Yeah. So, did Jesus rise from the dead? Is the topic for the debate? And so, um, okay, so we agreed on who's going to open and who's going to close. Then yes. um, we can begin with the debate now. William, you can begin with your opening statement. Fantastic. Thank you. In setting forth what St. Thomas Aquinas would call the historical pillars, we're left with quite possibly the greatest tour de force on the resurrection. The great Aquinas listed many historical proofs of the resurrection, and in listing these proofs, he relied on the early historical scriptures, the early enemies of the faith, and the earliest theologians and philosophers that were taught and trained by the apostles themselves. Of the main pillars that Aquinas put forth, and those that are historically verifiable, we will focus on three historical facts. The fact to be, fact to be covered was that Jesus Christ was executed by crucifixion, which is a truth shown forth in the Gospels, the New Testament writings, and the Jewish and pagan sources. The enemies of the Christians, such as Celsus, Marcus Fronto, Rabbi Akiba, Porfir- Porfirios, Josephus, at, who all mentioned that Pontius Pilate executed Christ by crucifixion, as well as Lucian, all attest to the historical truth that Christ was indeed crucified. Whereas there is speculation that Christ faked dying on the cross, a ludicrous and outlandish claim, all the early historical evidence points to Christ having been killed by crucifixion. Now, the second fact that we want to cover is the historicity and the, of the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. We must be clear what this debate is about today. Uh, this debate is not about the ascension, nor is it about the inerrancy of the scriptures, although those could be historically proven as well. Today's debate is on the historicity of the bodily resurrection of Christ in the earliest documents known to us. During Aquinas' time, he found opposition to the dating of the Gospels with claims that due to their late dating, that embellishments and legendary accounts began to creep in. Even though I disagree with such claims, today I will be confining myself to the writings that Mr. Barker would deem the earliest. And that brings us to the second pillar in Aquinas' masterful works, and, that, and this focus will be on the eyewitness accounts of the risen Christ. And in 1 Corinthians, we find a creed that Paul received that he puts forth. Now, I would remind you, brethren, in what terms I preached to you the gospel which you received, in which you stand, by which you are saved, if you hold it fast unless you believed in vain. For I deliver to you as the first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, that he appeared to more than 500 brethren at once, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. What must be taken into account is the historical force with which Paul puts forth this creed. Much is made of the so-called poem-like legendary form in Paul's traditional statements of the resurrection of Christ in 1 Corinthians. Unfortunately, such an assumption betrays common knowledge of the biblical language of the time. The very usage of paradosis for divine tradition opposes that of legend. As 1 Thessalonians points out, the earliest Christians, and Jews for that matter, held fast, meaning they held consistent to divine traditions. This meant that they were not preserved on parchment or in some old, dusty book, but rather the divine tradition was taught worldwide and was held fast. The very usage of paradosis eliminates the possibility of legend. And thus, Paul presents the historical message of the resurrection in the most important manner possible. 
he relates it in his writings after it was already known throughout the churches that Paul believed in the bodily resurrection of Christ and not a spiritual sort of symbolic resurrection is made evident further in his writings in, in 1 Corinthians 15, 35. But some man will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Paul, in answering the charge of the resurrection of the body, he asks the question postulated, with what body will they rise with? In verse 40, he notes the difference between heavenly and earthly bodies. He notes that the resurrected body will be an imperishable, glorious one. In verse 42, he says, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in, in, in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, raised in glory. It is sown a natural body, raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there's a spiritual body. And in our rebuttal and cross-examination areas, we will go over just what Paul means by spiritual body. I hope the listeners pay attention to spiritual here, because we're going to see that Paul, as shown in this very text, in verse 42 and 43, where he speaks of incorruption and raised in glory, that Paul's spiritual body is a very tangible very material body that he's speaking of, of Christ, of course. Indeed, the story of Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus was a very tangible encounter with Christ, where he was knocked down and encounters the risen Jesus in a blinding light and a glorious voice. But indeed, there is more in the recognized Pauline epistles that points to Paul believing in a bodily resurrection. In Romans 8.11, Paul tells us, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies, also through his spirit who dwells in you. So how was Christ raised? Bodily or simply in an immaterial manner? Well, Paul tells us that our bodies will receive life just like Christ received life. In Philippians 3.21, he tells us, Christ who will change our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power which enables him even to subject all things to himself. Paul's emphasis on the somati teis doxes, the glorious body, is a theme we will find all throughout the Gospels, as well as the Book of Acts, where the sermons are replete with a teaching on the empty tomb and the bodily resurrection. In the Book of Acts, Peter preaching on Pentecost makes a clear reference to the empty tomb of Christ. Brethren, I may say to you confidently of the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with, with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants upon his throne. He foresaw and spoke of the resurrection of Christ, and he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Here we note the stark contrast between Christ and David. David was be- dead and buried in a grave. Christ died and was also buried in a tomb. Although the text does not directly say it, it does tell us that David's tomb is with us. And I believe that is, uh, I've run out of time in my opening statement, and I will get to the rest of my statements um, either in my rebuttal period or my cross-examination. I will now give way to, um, to Dan Barker for his opening statement. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. Right. All right, Mr. Barker, you can go ahead and begin with your opening statement, sir. Very good. Thank you, William. It was very eloquent, very articulate. And during my rebuttal time, I will reply to the remark you just made in your opening statement. Uh, but this is my opening statement. And I used to preach yes. the resurrection of Jesus as I was an evangelical minister. I used to believe it. I used to preach it. And, and, you know, as you quoted Paul saying, without the resurrection, our faith is in vain. So it really does come down to that claim. But we have to remember here, and, you know, I think, I, I think Aquinas had a, a different perspective, but these stories about the the resurrection of Jesus and the so-called empty tomb, uh, th- that's what they are. They are stories. They are, they are not what we would call historical facts. Uh, they are, you know, they are accounts that were passed down. And many of these stories are mutually contradictory. Uh, and many of them can be shown to show exactly what William says they don't show evidence of legendary embellishment as the time goes by. It'd be like me, you know, I'm a member of an Indian tribe, and we have a story of the origin of the universe and the, and the continents on the back of a turtle that rose up from the waters, and the trees grew on the back of the turtle, and the rabbit came and kicked the blood clot and turned into humans. That's a cute story. I love that story. My grandparents used to tell that, and it's, and it's wonderful, and it's meaningful, but 
Nobody thinks the continents came on the back of a turtle. The story is extraordinary, and we automatically assume that extraordinary stories require more than just a, a mental assent or a faith. They require extraordinary proof. What we have with the resurrection stories are not extraordinary proof. They are not even close to extraordinary proof. They are stories. And the historical method um, might be a science. Maybe some people think history is not a science, but history is the wor worst tool to examine a miracle. If the miracle happened, and I'm not saying it didn't, I'm not going to be closed-minded, but if there really was a dead man who was truly dead for three days and he came back to life again, he came out of, if that really happened, uh, then history is the wrong tool for examining it. History has to assume natural regularity over time. History has to assume that continents are not formed on the back of turtles, no matter what the story says. And history has to assume that dead people do not rise. So therefore, we need something more than just a story in order to authenticate it. Uh, and most believers, like me, I used to say, well, we have faith. We believe it by faith. But uh, the look, looking for a miracle with history is, trying to, is like looking for a planet with a microscope. It's the wrong tool. But history is all you have. And history, we know, is very, very weak. Uh, Bart Ehrman's new book, Jesus Before the Gospels, points out that during those decades, before the first New Testament accounts were written, there was this long tradition, and we now know that human memory is very unreliable. We now know that those were not eyewitnesses. Whoever wrote the, the earliest Gospel of Mark it might have been a third-hand witness. Even Paul himself was not a direct eyewitness to Jesus. He had this experience of, of you know, being blinded. Some people say it was like an epileptic fit. Paul never claimed to have actually met the bodily Jesus, and yet Paul includes his appearance in 1 Corinthians 15, as William just read to us, as one of those appearances. And since Paul's appearance was not an appearance of a bodily resurrected Jesus, we can assume that that word that he used there, that word uh, ophi, which is from the Greek, where we get the word vision, he had a visionary experience. We can assume, therefore, that to be consistent with his writing, when he said, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, uh, he didn't even use the word resurrection. He used the word egiro there, which means to wake up. We can assume that those other appearances were likewise visionary, non non-physical appearances. So, uh, using history, we have to assume at least a common level of, of what is most likely to happen. If the resurrection did happen, we need much, much, much more evidence than some stories that were written decades after the fact. However, as I said earlier, the stories do show evidence of legendary growth. And, and William is right. 1 Corinthians 15 is the first account we have written, which is 25 years later. 25 years after the supposed account, written to people who were 1,500 miles away, who would have had no way to verify it. They were in Corinth, the Corinthians. The next account we have is about 40 years after it, which was Mark, the earliest one. And if you put these accounts in order in which they were written, Paul, Mark, Matthew, Luke, possibly the uh, Gospel of Peter, or maybe not, but then John w w in 90 to 100, if you put them in the order in which they were written across the first century, you will see... Uh, a remarkable growth in the number of extraordinary events. Paul doesn't have any. Paul's account has no empty tomb. He just used the word grave there. He didn't use the word nemeon, sepulcher. He just used the word grave, the most likely place where executed criminals were buried. And then Mark has maybe one extraordinary event with a, a man dressed in white. And then Matthew and Luke have more. And, then, and by the time you get to the end of the century, you have John with, with many, many more. So you can see the footprint of legendary growth coupled with the fact that human memory was really, really bad. We even know today, with the origin of many modern cults, how unreliable human memory is. I'm, I'm sure somebody remembered exactly the words of Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount and wrote them down exactly decades later. That didn't happen. We know, we know from the historical method and from human psychology that, that people embellish, they exaggerate, and that's what happened with the New Testament accounts. Uh, also, the New Testament accounts themselves, those five different accounts of the supposed resurrection of Jesus, are internally hopelessly discrepant. Uh, what time of the day did the women come? How many women were there? What was the message of the angels at the tomb? In fact, I wrote a, an article called Easter Challenge, Leave No Stone Unturned, in which I challenged people to read those accounts and put them together into a single, coherent, non-contradictory narrative that omits not a single detail. No one's been able to do that. Uh, 
Uh, where, where, what was the first post-resurrection appearance? Uh, to whom was the first appearance made? Where did Jesus' ascension take place? If you compare these so-called historical accounts, which are really just stories written by people many years later with bad memories, you, you find some agreement, but you find much more disagreement among them, which if you take all of these arguments as a cumulative argument, it doesn't disprove the resurrection of Jesus. What it does is it vastly lowers the likelihood. I think it drops it to right maybe a 0.5 probability that a dead man actually crawled out of a grave, including the dead bodies before the crucifixion, you know, that Matthew reports. All these graves opened, and these people came out and went back to their home, these zombies like a Halloween story. I don't believe that happened. I don't think William believed that happened. These are interesting stories written by primitive people who had strong beliefs, but I would not count them as any type of strong historical evidence or proof that a dead man actually rose from the grave. I'm done. Great. Fantastic. Okay. I, I, I believe the next one would be my five-minute rebuttal. Is that correct? That's fine with me. Host, yeah, I think the host might put might have forgotten to take himself off mute. <laughs> it sounds like crickets chirping. He, he fell asleep. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There you go. Sorry. I, I have myself muted. There you go. Okay, yeah. yeah. yeah you can get your five-minute rebuttal on, um, William. Fantastic. I'll start now. Thank you very much for that, Dan. I think um, I, I really uh, respect your opening statement. Uh, I think it's very respectful, even towards Christianity, believe it or not. Although I would definitely disagree with you, and I, I think, um, you know, I wish we had a lot, of, a lot more time to talk about uh, the women in the tomb, uh, the, the, the appearances, uh, what about the number, li- the number of women listed, was the tomb already open, how many angels. I think all of those can be answered quite easily, and I think they've been answered already by some of the earliest uh, uh, Christian gigantic theologians like uh, uh, Augustine and Athanasius. Uh, I don't think that there are any um, contradictions there at all, but uh, – I, I do want to move a little bit forward. Hopefully I'll be able to get to that in maybe my cross ups or my closing. But uh, there, there is a part- particular word that, um, that, uh, that Dan brought up, and he brought up the Greek word ophe, uh, uh, which is, of course, I think anybody familiar with uh, the resurrection accounts and with uh, the biblical Greek is a word that ophe is used for visionary accounts in the Bible. But the problem with jumping on the Greek word ophe and then in turn claiming that when Paul or others use this term, that it's being used for a visionary appearance and not an actual physical appearance, is that Ophthe is also used for real physical appearances. And each and every time it's a visionary appearance, appearance, we get notes from the author of such. And when it's an actual physical appearance, we get notes from the author of such. Paul never used Ophthe for a visionary appearance when mentioning Christ. Uh, but when he mentions the Macedonian appearing before him, he does use it as a visionary account, but he gives this indication as such by saying that this is a visionary appearance. So we've got to be careful with the text because if we aren't, we're going to tend to make mistakes such as the one that Mr. Barker has made here. Uh, Mr. Barker also mentions that Paul had no, I guess, uh, extraordinary or no, or, or, or no amazing accounts uh, in his, um, uh, I guess, in his. Remember one thing, first off, Paul is not recounting the narrative of the resurrection. Paul is passing on a, the, the paradosis or as I like to call it correctly, pronounced the paradosis, which is an, a, a, a tradition, a, a sacred tradition held by all of the early church. And that tradition was this here. We'll see if Paul didn't believe in any amazing accounts in his writings. Because he says in, in 1 Corinthians 15 and 35, he's answering the charge of the resurrection of the body. And he, 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 he postulates this question, with what body will they rise? And in verse 40, he notes the difference, as I pointed out in my opening, of heavenly and earthly bodies, he notes that the resurrected body will be an imperishable, glorious one. He says, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. The body is raised in incorruption. So uh, to, to try and claim that Paul did not believe in a bodily resurrection, I think Paul refutes that himself in his writings. Um, I also want to point out that you need to notice that in verse 42, Paul uses the Greek word agairo, in connection with, with, uh, with resurrection. If the claim is to be made that the terms are not being used interchangeably, then the burden of proof must be shown as to why the whole context of these verses are in reference to the soma, the body, which is being raised in incorruptible form. And a further interest is the usage of soma and pneumatikos in Paul. 
Solomon's never used as anything other than the, other than the material body in Paul. And the same goes for pneumonicos. So Paul here is speaking of an actual resurrected glorious body. Remember what Paul says. It is sown in, in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown in a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There's a natural and there's a spiritual body. So what is very interesting here is we find this theme current throughout Paul. And I understand Mr. Barker would not want to go into the Gospels. I guess uh, you know the view is that those are a later time embellishments began to creep in, which I disagree with. But we can find this theme of, uh, of miraculous accounts, not just in Paul, but you can find it in Mark also. I, I guess uh, Mr. Barker mentions how uh, Mark, which would be the earliest Gospel in his opinion, doesn't have many extraordinary accounts. I, I highly disagree. If excuse me. If we're going to confine ourselves to the resurrection alone, tying in the Eucharistic account of Mark with the resurrection of the body, as they're both heavily tied together, would eliminate the whole position that there are limited, extraordinary accounts in Mark, and then all of a sudden, legendary uh, things began to creep in. What's more, if you want to focus on the enemies of Christ in the early church, I, I haven't even had the time to go through them. What, what about, what about Celsus? I would like to see what Mr. Barker has to say about Celsus, who, who's writing in, I believe, the mid-100s, but he's recounting history. All scholars agree that Celsus is talking about history, and he's talking about the risen Christ. He believes that it was, it was a juggler's act. He believes it was a hoax, that he faked his death. But nevertheless, this is an enemy of the church that is talking about Christ in this manner, and that is a miraculous type of manner. And that, that's it for my uh, rebuttal. I will give way to Mr. Barker now. Okay, yeah, thank, thank you, William. You. you can begin, Mr. Barker. All right, thanks. So, so yeah, Celsus was passing things on. So was Tacitus and so was Suetonius. Many second century people were taking those stories from earlier and as if they were true. You know, it's like, like, do you believe everything you read? Uh, many of them actually did. And by the way, Tac neither Tacitus nor Suetonius mentioned Jesus. They mentioned a Christ figure. But um, uh, And Mark, if you look at Mark, and of course we're talking only about the resurrection here. That's all we're talking about. And my claim was that if you take the resurrection stories themselves and put them in a line when they were written, you will see a remarkable growth, legendary growth through history, which happens with legends and and mythologies through time. It happens now. It happened with that Elian Gonzalez myth that happened, the, you know, that Cuban refugee and the Virgin Mary sightings and the dolphin fish. It happened within a few days. And so when you think over decades of the first century, you can see how the legend actually grew. Uh, but um, um, you're using a term which is not defined and which has actually never been clearly defined or understood, and you're throwing it out there as if it means something. You're using the word spiritual. And you say, and you're coupling it with the word body, spiritual body. What the heck does that mean? What does the word spiritual actually mean? It's never been defined in positive terms. It's only been defined in terms of what it is not, non-corporeal, intangible, uh, ineffable, whatever. A spirit has never actually been defined. How much does a spirit weigh? How much space does it take up? How, you know, how, would you def how does it differ from nothing at all? And I think what you are proving by using the phrase spiritual body is exactly what most Christians today believe, what I used to believe when I was a believer, that when my grandmother died, her body rotted in the ground, but that her spirit rose to heaven. Her spirit ascended to heaven. And maybe you could call that a spiritual body, but whatever that is, it's not the body that died and went in the grave. My grandma is still rotting in the grave there in, in uh, eastern Oklahoma even though I used to believe that she had risen. And I think the earliest Christians, they were believers. Uh, their Lord died, and, you know, he failed their expectations. He did not establish a kingdom on earth. And so then Peter, who was totally distraught, prays, and he talks to Jesus, and he says, I talked to Jesus. Well, Jesus, their belief at the time, which I don't believe now, but their belief was that their Lord had spiritually ascended, and there was this new body, not a physical body, flesh and blood body we know from first corinthians 15 which william is quoting that this tradition that paul was passing on was edited by paul paul puts himself into that story and he used it. paul knew the word anastasis he knew the word resurrection but he didn't use it there he used the word egero which 
uh, was the word. Uh, you know, when, when Jesus was awakened on the ship, the di- disciples came and he was awakened. No one thinks that he ascended to heaven on the ship. He just woke up. And that word ophi, which is the past part of both from um, ho, uh, horao, from the appearance, the word ophi was used in the transfiguration, for example, when the disciples went to see Moses and Elijah on the hill. Does anyone think that Moses and Elijah's physical bodies were in there, that their empty graves exist somewhere? Obviously, those early believers had these strange mystical spiritual beliefs about whatever you want to call this thing, a spiritual body. I think that underscores the fact that the actual Jesus, if he exists in history, his actual body, his physical body, the one that you and I would know, did not raise from the dead. Something else, they believe something else happened. And of course, in Paul's own appearance to this Jesus was not a physical appearance. He didn't walk up. And, you know, 20 some, uh, 15 or 20 years after Jesus died and resurrected, Paul meets him on the road to Damascus and he has this some voice in the cloud what what did jesus need a shave did he have to go to the bathroom was his body hanging up in the cloud i mean did he actually shake hands with jesus no paul even said in in uh, in galatians uh that it was not what was revealed to me was revealed in me not to me so it was a spiritual experience he had not a physical bodily re- resurrected experience thank you mr barker we're going to go ahead and now We'll see with the uh, cross-examination period, and we will have six um, six-minute cross-exams. If you guys want to, I can I can extend that to seven-minute cross-exams if you if you would like. Or would you rather to, um, increase your closing statements, Tom? It, it's up to it's up to Dan. I, I really don't mind either way. Well, I you know I'd rather move fast so we can get to questions. I think questions are a lot more fun. Um, Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You know, you know what? Let, let's let's do. I guess let's do. I guess six minute um, uh, cross X. We have what three each, right? Yeah. And okay. then we can do our, right, so our the, closing, and we'll get to questions faster. Okay. Okay. So we'll, then we'll get to that. Okay. So we'll just keep it as I, it I is. I think there. I have the first, right? I think I have the yeah, first. Yeah. You have the first. You have the first cross exam. Fantastic. Thank. Thank you very much for that uh, opening and rebuttal, uh, uh, Mr. Barker. I really, really enjoyed. Uh, um, I, think it, I think it was fantastic. Uh, it, br- it does bring me, though, to my first question, and I think it is one of your most consistent claims, and I do want to, um, <clears throat> I want to, I guess, uh, I, I like the fact that you're very consistent. So one of your claims is that when Paul uses spiritual, as you brought up in your, I believe, your opening and rebuttal, is um, I believe your argument is that he's contrasted an actual body with a, I guess, a symbolic or an immaterial one. I, is that a correct assessment? Well, you have to tell me that. Uh, I, I think I don't, I don't even think he was talking about a a body in First Corinthians. I think he was talking about the spirit of Jesus ascending, because he said flesh and he said a few verses later, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So um, only a theologian can talk theologian talk. But whatever he meant, he did not mean a physical body. Right, right. And, and I do want to get to that flesh and blood statement. But uh, dealing with a with the term spiritual, um, when he does use the term spiritual and then he brings, he uses the Greek word for soma, for body, um, I guess my question is this. Um, in all of Paul's usages of pneumatikos for spiritual, are you aware of him ever using this Greek word for something immaterial? Well, the word soma can be immaterial. It can, you can be talking oh. about the body of an argument, the body, you know, the word... By by putting an adjective in front of the word soma, you are turning it from a physical thing into something non-physical. Where does Paul ever use soma in an immaterial manner? Well, right there, when he qualifies it with the word spiritual, he's using it in an immaterial manner. That'd be like so, saying my grandma, my grandma's in heaven in a spiritual sense, or spiritual body, or spiritual being, or spiritual essence. In other words, okay, it's not a I, physical flesh and Understood completely. I understand your point, which is why that brings me to my question, my original question. If you're going to make the assertion that Paul is using the pneumatikos, and I believe it's Soma right afterwards, if you're making the assertion that pneumatikos is used for immaterial, I guess connecting that with, uh, with uh, the Soma, where in all of Paul's usages, I believe he uses pneumatikos, I want to say, um, maybe 10 times or so. Um, it's in 1 Corinthians 2.15, uh, 3 1, 1437, Galatians 6 1, Ephesians 6 12. Where is that term ever used for something immaterial? 
I can see looking through Paul's writings, each and every time he uses it, he's using it for the material. So that would bring me to my question. Where is that term spiritual ever used for immaterial? I mean, you, obviously you can't point to this particular verse as proof if this verse is the one that's being uh, contended. Well, okay, but even you have to admit, those are theological questions. Those are not historical questions. Nobody in history uses spiritual as some kind of an evidence for a, an act in, in space-time. No one ever uses that word. So whatever Paul meant, even if you're right, even if he was totally consistent, whatever he meant is off the table when it comes to an actual historical examination of what, what happened there in Palestine in the first century. So theologians can talk. You know, one of my favorite jokes is theology is a subject with no object. I mean, there's no actual substance there. And uh, Paul might have had some ideas, but how does that affect whether or not that thing actually happened in history? Where People have ideas all the time. A lot of my Native American ancestors would think that the turtle was a spiritual turtle upon which the spiritual continents... So what? Theologians can talk in circles, but we're talking about do we actually believe that a really dead man who was dead, whose body was decomposing, as we know it, I mean, not you know, not fainted, actually came back out of the dead. If that happened, and I'm not, I'm not saying it didn't, if that happened, it w- would require much more proof than just some theological double talk with, with Greek words put together. Uh, you, you know what I'm saying? We're talking about an actual hack of history. Yeah. Oh, of course. I understand exactly what you're saying, but uh, again, I don't understand where you're getting this sort of theological double talk if Paul is consistent with his usage of both those terms each time, each and every time he uses them in his writings. It is for something material. So I, I don't see there, there being any theological double talk here. I understand your point, your point that perhaps uh, regardless of whether or not Paul is using these for material, uh, what's to say he's not lying? I understand exactly the point that you're trying to make, or what's to say this is even reliable? I believe those are completely different questions, but the question at hand, I just want to make it clear to the audience, the listening audience, that Paul does use For when he says spiritual body, he's talking about an actual, physical, resurrected body of Christ. I think we can at least come to that conclusion, that he's at least teaching that sort of theology. Would you at least agree with that? Well, yes, but you have two undefined words then that Paul is asserting. You have the word spiritual, which is undefined, and then you have a totally weird different kind of word body that means something other than molecules and cells and actual physical blood pumping through a real heart. These are two words that are fuzzy theological words that don't have any reference if you're asking a historical question. Completely understood. My, my only point was to make the to make it clear that regardless of whether or not Paul gives us a concrete definition each time he uses these terms, and particularly in 1 Corinthians 15, he's using it for a material body. That was my only point that I was trying to make. Mr. Barker, in your right, in, Paul, in Paul's writings, um, you bring up the usage of the Greek word opse. Do, do you believe that that is proof of a, a uh, I guess, an, a, a symbolic or an immaterial appearance? What was your point in using that Greek word? I was kind of confused, confused with that. Well, I didn't use the word. That's the word in First Corinthians, and it's also the word right, right. used with what the transfiguration. And the point is, um, we don't even have to go outside of First Corinthians 15, which, by the way, is the first earliest resurrection account, which happened, which was probably written around the year 55, let's say, what, 25 years after it. Uh, right. Within that account itself, Paul tacks on, he edits this account that it was passed on to him from someone else. By the way, in oral history, and we know that oral histories are unreliable, human memories are unreliable, and that this was probably not even a second eyewitness, but a third eyewitness. But Paul tacks onto that account. Last of all, he appeared, that's Ophi, he appeared also to me. We know the story of Jesus appearing to Paul, and we know that was not a bodily appearance. He said, when God chose to reveal his son in me. Paul is reporting a spiritual experience there. Thank you very much for that, Mr. Barker. Now I will give way to your turn to cross-examine me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you can call me Dan. You can call me Dan. I call you William. You know. Okay, great, uh, great. Yeah. I, I when, I de- habit. <laughs> <laughs> when I debated Cardinal Pell of Sydney, you know, he's now in the Vatican. Um, yes, I know exactly. Uh, he he said, what do we call each other? I said, well, you call me Dan, I'll call you George. So, so they were all calling him. <laughs> 
his his <laughs> eminence. He was the arch archbishop, you know. And so we had a debate, and I said, "Hey, George, and hey, Dan," and I think he was uncomfortable just being treated like a normal, you know. So just we're, we're just we're just two guys talking. Okay, so I, I, you, know, um, you know, if he if he was unable to convert you, I'm going to have a tough time tonight, aren't I? <laughs> well, <laughs> that was that was broadcast on Australian radio. That was really a fun. You can hear that online somewhere. Um, I, I've never heard and, that. Yeah. And he said, uh, he said, you know, you atheists are like dogs at a at a musical concert. You hear the notes, but you don't hear the music because we're spiritually blind, basically, is what he said. <laughs> and so, I, and I took it as a compliment. You know, I mean, what's wrong with being called a dog? A dog is another animal, and humans are animals too. But That's in correct. any event, okay. So my question, I guess, um, yeah, you're right. There's not enough time, but I would like you, as the theologian, to dis- define for me, in easy to understand terms, what does the word Spirit mean? That's a very good question. Spirit is used in a number of ways in the Bible. Uh, um, you know, as we were speaking about the Greek word uh, for spiritual, pneumatikos, at times that word is used in connection with the Holy Spirit. Uh, and at times, pneuma, which is a Greek word for spirit, is used for, um, I guess, sort of, um, you know, inner experiences, inner symbolic type of uh, appearances, uh, as well as. Panuma is also used uh, to reference the third person of the Holy Trinity, which would be the Holy Spirit. Um, so it's, it's really tough to give the Greek word panuma a single one type of definition, as there are a number of multiple meanings for that Greek word. But I think one of the most consistent usages, as we've seen earlier in this debate and the opening and our rebuttal and then my cross, is, is that we see when Paul uses pneumatikos, which of course is different for spirit, he's connecting spiritual body in a very different manner than we would use in our, you know, modern day type of thinking. You know, today you say, uh, I guess, and I'm talking to you, Dan, and I'll tell you, uh, you know, I, I saw this, and, you know, I had a very spiritual encounter. You know, we're going to be using the term much different today in modern day English than it was used back then in, in Koine Greek. Yeah, but what do you what does you have an answer to the question? What does the word spirit what is a spirit? What does it mean as opposed to being nothing at all, a non corporeal, intangible? Actually, when we're talking I, I about it, what is it? Not, I, I don't believe that it is not that it is uh, incorporeal. I do believe that uh well again, in, in in what context? In what context are you referring to spirit? Because you're asking me, what do I believe spirit means? And I can tell you right now. I can give you the definition of what I believe the Holy Spirit is. I believe it's a real, tangible person. Uh, it's another person of the Holy Trinity. So if, if you ask me in another reference, I could give you a different meaning that is used in the Scriptures. So there are a number so of is, in which, which the word spirit is used. It's also so used when for, you power, say, for physical power as well. So, okay. So you just described the word spirit in physical terms. The word power, power is work over time, which is material and Correct. physical. And you said the Holy Spirit is a person. So is, does the Holy Spirit have molecules and cells, and does it have blood pumping through it? Is it, is it, is it a physical being that, that we would use the word person? If not, what is it? Well, again, using, using the argument of um, does, the, does, does the Holy Spirit or does Christ even have blood pumping through their cells – you need to realize what we're talking about here. In the, when we talk about the raised spiritual body of Christ, or if we even talk about the, the, the body, the personhood of the Holy Spirit, we don't necessarily need to, I guess, confine ourselves to modern-day explanations of, you know what, there's blood pumping through them. Do they, do they have all the natural activities that a normal person would have? These, these, are, are, glorified, these are glorified bodies. This is completely different than a regular human body. So our manner of being able to give a definition would not be, I guess, as broad as, you know, defining a human person. You know, I think we would be very limited in that regard. So you, you haven't actually given us a definition. When I asked that question of Cardinal Pell in Sydney, he said, well, I can't define it to you, but it's, it's, you just know it. And, and I, so in, and I think in a gave sense, you a great answer because, as I just pointed out to you, you're asking for me to give a particular definition to a word that is used in a number of different manners. I, I, I would, if I were Cardinal Pell, I would, have, I would have been shocked that you would be asking that question. If you're asking this question from a theological perspective, which, of course, we're debating the resurrection. So in regards to debating the resurrection, if you're asking what a spirit is, in this regard, it, it is a, the spirit of Christ that is being referred to in all these verses is 
Christ himself, a spiritual body, a glorious, incorruptible body. So in this context, that is what spirit means. But you okay, can't give one single definition. There are a number of meanings. Okay, for well, I, I, I would be happy with any definition, and you haven't given any actual definition. You've used words. You use the word symbolic, and you use the word glorious. And the word glory and symbolic and non-corruptible, those, those terms actually don't have any reference. If we're talking about a historical question, right, did Jesus rise from the dead? What Did the resurrection happen? Then we need to use terms that are understood and defined and accepted by people. And so far you have not given us an actual definition. You know, how much space does the body of Christ occupy in space-time? How much does it weigh? Does he need to shave? Does, you know what I'm talking about? You're talking about a symbolic, I, I, I know exactly, mystical I know thing. Exactly what you're talking about and and, and to ask questions like does, does this christ need to shave does, does he have blood pumping to the to his veins you know with all due respect mr barker these have nothing to do with the resurrection of christ does paul teach do we have early historical evidence that christ resurrected from the dead physically yes we do you want a particular definition for spirit and and i just i told you a number of times paul himself asked the question what body does, does, are we going to rise with and in comparing that with how Christ rise, he made and contrasted a heavenly and an earthly body. He notes that the resurrected body is going to be an imperishable, glorious one. Can I give you the exact definition of how it is imperishable and how it's glorious? No, I cannot. But I can tell you that the teaching is that Christ resurrected physically in an imperishable, actual, physical, glorious body. And that does differ from the regular body. So well, then at least the resurrection, I think that's clear. Well, then can you agree with me that although we, we don't agree on whether there is such a thing as a spirit or even a coherent definition of a spirit, that at least you and I can agree that the theological question about a spirit or a spiritual body is off the table in a historical question. Did Jesus rise from the dead is a historical question. And history, ha- history is a tool that's very limited. History can't just blow itself up and invent all these glorious spiritual words, and then we can say, look, at the resurrection happened. At least agree with me that if we're looking at a historical question, those terms are off the table. The, the, the term of Christ raising in a, an actual physical body? Is that what you're speaking about, that that's off the table? No, I, 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 okay. the word spirit, the word spirit and glory and incorruptible, those words are off the historical table. Okay, I think it's going to be a... Okay, I, I'll, I'll get to that in your next cross-examination. Um, okay, now I guess it would be uh, my turn to cross-examine. Okay, I'm yes. going to go ahead and start now. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Mr. Barker. Okay, you, um, you, you made a statement. Um, I believe that it was, it was in regards to the, to the word opse for um, – was it opse? I think it was opse for appearances. And I think you mentioned um, the transfiguration. And, and you mentioned how uh, nobody believed that to be actually physical. Uh, would, could you provide evidence for that? Uh, uh, for that not being for the for there not being a belief in that being actually physical? Well, two things. <clears throat> um, the very word transfiguration means it's different from what the original body was. Moses and Elijah, if they existed in history. Um, there's questions about that, but let's assume they did. They were they were physical bodies that were born and conceived and raised and ate food and they went to the bathroom and they had sex and all those things. Uh, we can we can assume that those bodies after they died rotted in the grave. They were they were in the ground just like everyone else rotted, you know. Although Elijah, there was a story about him being taken up in chariots or something, uh, um, which is an extraordinary story. But the transfiguration itself, and I don't have the Bible in front of me, but I think even Jesus later says, by the way, he hints that, by the way, this is not a physical thing. Oh, these, they, they appeared unto uh, Peter and James and, and John and Jesus, uh, and then Jesus was there with the radiation. I guess to give him some authenticity that Jesus had these great patriarchs behind him. So that word of the is used there in the transfiguration. This is the exact same word that Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 15 to describe the appearance of Jesus to the disciples and to the 500 and, and, and last of all to him. So I think we can see in context in the Bible that that word of the, I, I, I pronounce it the way modern Greeks do. You probably pronounce it the scholarly way. But that word of <laughs> uh, and, and there is a difference. A modern Greek would say of the. But, um, yes. So, uh, but in in the 
Well, you know, I, in, I've met a number of individuals that, that pronounce it very, you know, differently, uh, such as yeah. such as some individuals pronounce uh, Pneuma as Pneuma. So, you know, I, I understand exactly what you're saying. Um, yeah. In modern Greek, yeah. In modern Greek, we say Pneuma. Yeah. Well, yeah. And so, <laughs> so, and, and, and I'm sorry, I don't have the Bible. I'm, I'm traveling right now, so I didn't bring my actual Bible with me. But, uh, but during that transfiguration, uh, if you read further in. Uh, I guess we'll invite the readers to do that. Read further, and there's an indication that, oh, there wasn't, you know, they appeared, although there wasn't any body, something like that was going on, to make it clear that, that that we should not be looking for the empty tomb of Moses or the empty tomb of Elijah, that these guys who'd been dead for centuries, suddenly their bodies are hanging around somewhere. So it's the same question about Jesus. Jesus had been dead for decades, and suddenly Paul sees his actual body, whatever that means. So... Uh, that's what I'm yeah, trying to I, say, I, that that, that yeah, word ospi did I, not mean physical. He did not shake hands with a physical being. Is your contention that uh, ospi is always used for, uh, I guess, a sort of immaterial appearance? Is that, is that your argument? No. I mean, I'm sure no, you're we, aware that that word, okay. So uh, no, word not at all. Used for physical appearances as well. You are aware that that Greek word is used for physical appearances as well, am I correct? Yeah, but he appeared on... So, suppose... So suppose I uh, I wondered if my neighbor was home. I wonder if my neighbor's home. So I walked over to his house. I knocked on the door, and my neighbor appeared unto me. What a weird way to say that I saw my neighbor. You know what I mean? What a weird way to describe a physical appearance. So that's, that's how you would describe a haunted house, right? I'm walking through the kitchen, and then it appeared unto me. I mean, that's how they were thinking in religious context, that this body of this dead Jesus who had been dead a long time, he appeared unto Peter, he appeared unto Paul, he appeared unto, you know what I mean? It, it, it's a way yeah, of talking I, that I makes it look like it's not really, he, he didn't actually meet, he didn't actually meet him and shake his hand and hug him and, and meet a physical body. This was a different kind of meeting, a non-physical way of meeting, even in context, that word of the, and you, and you and I both know that many of these Greek words in the New Testament had a flexibility of usage, just like we say, yeah, uh, and in Ma- yeah, it, it I, appears, this particular Greek word appears in Matthew 17, 4, and, and I find it very interesting that, that you, you think that the transfiguration would have not been an actual physical appearance. I, I'm going to disagree with you, because, it, it, again, for the listening audience, if you, want, if you want to turn to Matthew 17, 4, I, I'm going to argue that it's clear that Moses and Elijah appeared bodily. Uh, remember, what does Peter do? Peter offers to make three dwellings, literally three tents for them. And I would suggest the listening audience look up the Greek word skenos. But in the Septuagint, you're going you're to find that this, this Greek word appears 11 times. And each and every time it appears, it is in reference to something physical that would house a physical being. And again, Mr. I understand, Dan, that you, you, you don't believe that this is being used for, for something actually uh, physical, but I think that the usage is clear here. I think it is being used for something physical. Yeah, well, I disagree. I, mean, I think what, the, what, what, the, what, the first century believers yeah. had all sorts of strange beliefs, and I don't think they believe. It, it, they believe probably like you that there's some some kind of a thing called a spiritual body, whatever that whatever that means. Uh, I'm trying to look it up here. I don't have my Bible, but yeah, uh, it, it, it's actually Matthew 17:4, and, and and I would. I mean, the, the main reason I disagree with your, the way you use Ophthe is because Ophthe is used, uh, I, I think we get clear indication whenever it's a visionary appearance. And, and I think it's clear here that this, these are not visionary appearances when Paul is talking about Christ, particularly Christ's appearance to him. I don't think that was a visionary appearance. I think he physically appeared. I think he believed that he physically appeared to him. All righty, uh, gentlemen. Yes. Yeah, um, your turn now, now. Uh, now it's uh, Dan's turn to cross the So, by the way, who's got the dog? <laughs> not me. That, that, would, that, that, that is not my dog. That is a dog that appeared at my door. I have my window open, and it began to bark like crazy. <laughs> 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 well, you just but, proved but your yeah. point. Did you hear what you just said? <laughs> the, the dog appeared at your door. The dog appeared at your door. Well, 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 well there you go. A real yeah, there you case. go. I, I, I think we've sold the debate. <laughs> so I take it the dog had made a physical appearance. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, he did. Uh, okay, all right, yeah, okay. Uh, Dan, you, you you can go ahead and begin with your course exam. <laughs> Absolutely. Um. 
Yeah, okay, so let me look back through my notes here really fast here. Um, um, so uh, you mentioned Mark, and, and you know that Mark was the earliest gospel written. Um, and historians generally agree that Mark was written around the year 70, and maybe, yes. uh, maybe more or less. If Jesus did live and die, and let's assume that he did, he died around the year 30. So four decades have gone by, and Mark... Mark tells, actually Mark has a very short, the very brief description of the resurrection. And I think you agree with me that the verses following it were attacked on later. Um, but um, notice that in Mark... No, I don't agree with that. Well, okay, whatever. There, but you do know that in most Bibles, and in, in many Bible theologians, the, talk, the stuff about drinking poison and handling snakes was most biblical it, scholars it, agreed that, that was... Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. There is contention... As to whether that as to whether that existed in the original autographs or not, I I, I can agree with you in regards to that. I, I don't think yeah, it's relative to the, the debate, but yeah, okay. No, I don't. But 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 the point is that assuming that that was tacked on later, then the book of Mark actually ends the actual end of the first gospel without belief in the resurrection. The women see this white man at the tomb, and I will grant you that in those days the describing a man dressed in white was probably describing an angel, although they didn't use, he didn't use the word angel like the later ones did. In fact, the later <clears throat> Gospels made it into two angels. And you can see as time goes, the story gets bigger and bigger. It exaggerates as time goes. In fact, where were they standing and where were they seated and what messages? It got more and more elaborate as time went. But in Mark, you just have this very, very, very simple account. And the women did not go out and preach the resurrection. In fact, they, there, there's no mention, actually, of a resurrected Jesus. All you have is this, white, this guy in white saying he is not here. Yeah, so you don't have the body. You don't have the physical appearances. You don't have any post-resurrection appearances. You have these women leaving the tomb. And then, they, they, and then it says, neither said they anything to anyone because they were afraid. So the first gospel, the earliest actual gospel, uh, you know, after Paul's... Uh, um, you know what I would consider to be a legendary account. The first gospel doesn't actually have a resurrection of Jesus or any bodily appearances. It's not until later, and uh, so I guess I would ask you: Do, do you agree that the, the the gospel of Mark has a very simple, less uh, extraordinary account than the later gospels that followed? Do you agree with that? I don't agree. And and, and to touch upon your statement in, in regards to the angels, I, I don't think that's a contradiction. Because because remember, I think I think um. I think you're quite well aware that the Greek word angelos is used in a number of different ways. You know, uh, what does angel mean? It means messenger. And, and the description of these individuals, I think, is clear that they, you know, one of them says that they were uh, men. I, I don't think that there's any contradiction here because of exactly how the Bible uses the term for angel. I also don't, I, you remember what Mark 16, 4 says. Mark, it, it tells us, when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. And you're going to connect that with uh, Luke 24, 2, and I believe, I think it's John 21. I think they connect perfectly fine here. I don't think that I, – I know what you're getting at. I, I don't think that you have Mark and then you have a natural, oh, I guess, a legendary accounts began to creep in. I don't think so. I think that there were a number of miraculous accounts that you can find in Mark that you can tie directly to the resurrection. So, I mean, let, let's say – let me let me just uh, say that I agree with you, and I say, you know what, Mark ends early. Uh, you don't have an actual, uh, you know, resurrection account being recounted. Even though I do disagree with that, I think that we, in the in the Eucharistic account alone, of Mark, Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John, I think that that in and of itself alone presupposes the belief in the resurrection, in the resurrected, glorious body of Christ. So I, but I don't at least agree you, with that. I don't think. But at least you can agree with me that uh, at least agree with me according to the text itself, not later theological shoehorning back into history. Uh, the text itself, Mark does not have any earthquake story. Mark doesn't actually use the word angel, although I will grant you that a man dressed in white might have been understood as a angel. It doesn't have a rolling stone story where there's this earthquake. It doesn't have any dead bodies crawling out of the graves. It doesn't have any stories about Jesus disappearing. Do you agree with me that those later stories happen in the later Gospels, not in you know, Matthew, uh, Matthew, Luke, and John? At least agree with me that as you go later in history, you find more of those extraordinary stories in the text than you yeah, find in for, the text of, of Mark. For me to right? agree with that, I, I, I don't agree. For me to agree with that, I would, it, it would be making the assertion that I believe that Mark must be the earliest gospel. I don't believe that. I don't think Mark is the earliest gospel. 
and, and I think this question that you're, that you're asking me, I think it's answered perfectly fine, perfectly in a clear, cogent manner by, uh, by Augustine. I think you're very well of, uh, of St. Augustine, who, who speaks about how the earthquake uh, happened in one certain location. And he talks about, he says, in our time, this has been recounted a number of, by a number of individuals outside of the biblical text. So I, I don't think that as you go later into time, you all of a sudden have sorts of, you know, magical or miraculous things that are all of a sudden being popped up that Mark did not believe in. I, I think just because Mark doesn't recount the exact same thing that Matthew, Luke, or John recount, I don't think that in and of itself is proof that he didn't believe in that. I mean, he's just recounting it from his perspective. Okay. Um... <clears throat> yeah, but at least the text itself, you're agreeing that at least at the face value of the text, whether wherever else they oh, may the have believed or thought. The text is different. Well, I, I grant so, uh, the what, text is different. I mean, they're different Gospels. We're talking about history here. We're talking about historical artifacts from the past, and these documents are texts which report supposedly some historical events in the past. So uh, uh, I, um, I understand, but I, I'm not of the persuasion that just because these are historical documents that they're going to have to report every single little detail the exact same way another author who would have seen it from a different perspective would have recorded it. I agree with you, and that's the point I'm trying to make, that as other reporters, other writers report this at later times as the time passes, you find actually more textual extraordinary accounts in the later Gospels than you do in the earlier one. That's all I'm saying. You can attribute it any way you like to. In the book of Matthew, okay. for example, talking about the stone, in Mark, the stone was moved away. But you do know that if you read the book of Matthew, and you do know that these Gospels were written to a certain group of people to stand alone. They didn't compare notes. The earliest readers did not have John in them. That The book of Matthew actually reports that when the women got to the tomb, the, the stone was still there, and it was removed, it was rolled away after they arrived rather than before they arrived. You agree with that, right? Uh, I disagree, but now that it's my cross-ex, I, I will continue with that. I'm gonna, I, will, I will go right back into that. Let, let me just start the timer for my – I think it's my last cross-examination. Let me just start the timer, and, and I'm, I'll continue that exact point with you. I don't agree at all with, uh, with that, and, and I, I, I guess I'm going to answer it and phrase it in a question for you. I think Matthew is uh, – I think it's clear that he's not telling things in a chronological manner, which would make sense as several of the passages from the Septuagint that he hearkens to are told out of a certain order. The women are literally coming to see the tomb, and then Matthew switches to the tale of how the stone was rolled back. It obviously did not occur right at that moment because Matthew switches back in verse 5, and he says, but the angel said to the women, and then what does he say? Jesus, who was crucified, is not here. He's been raised. So clearly, once the women had arrived, the tomb is empty. Otherwise, they would have witnessed the resurrection. I would not have needed the angel to notify them of something that had already occurred. I mean, do you agree with that assessment, or am I overstepping there? No, I disagree. If you read Matthew alone, it was not taken well, out well, of order. Tell me how, how, well, well, then tell me how it's not. Because if you read the book of Matthew, especially the chapter before 28 and chapter 28, you see that the author of the book of Matthew, whoever that was, and it wasn't Matthew, but whoever that was, inserted very clear time markers between segments of things that were happening. This At this time of day, and then they went here, and you can see the time markers in the writing style. And in Matthew 28... Uh, uh, we talk about uh, there's a time marker, and then what follows between that time marker and the next time marker is one coherent narrative with nothing broken up. The stone was still there when the women arrived. Uh, by the way, w William, I'm sorry. Um, um, I, I guess I misunderstood. I thought this was just a one-hour show here, and I've got a ride out front here going to pick me up in about 15 minutes. So are we getting close to being done here? Uh, oh, about Maybe about 20 minutes close away. To or yeah. Yeah, well, then, yeah, but do you mind if we? Yeah, do you mind if I? Do you mind if I wrap up and then you guys could do the questions after that? Would that be okay? Because they. Uh... Well, yeah, we we can do. Okay. I'll do the cross ups, then you can do the cross ups, and we'll do fast closing, and I'll take the questions. Well, I, I'd rather just close now because I think I I don't want to uh, impose on these people too much here. Um, so and if you can give me about four minutes, I guess I can wrap up the cross ups and. Then we can go to All right, let's do that. All right. Law. Okay, let's, let's do that. Just, okay, uh, thanks. Okay, yeah, not a problem. Uh, Mr. Barker, in, in your book, Godless, and in several interviews and debates, you point to a phrase um, that flesh and blood cannot inherit heaven. 
for proof that Christ could not have bodily risen from the dead. Uh, are you aware of how many times this particular phrase, flesh and blood, appears in the New Testament? I don't. I have not counted those. It appears three times. Uh, can you show one example of the usage of flesh and blood to where it is not referring to the mortal human condition? To the what human condition? The mortal human condition. Because you use this argument, I guess, to as sort of evidence that Christ must not have bodily resurrected from the dead. And you point out, you point to this verse, which is uh, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. My argument is that each and every time this is used, it is being used to talk about the mortal human condition. Would you agree with that or would you disagree with that? Well, there, there is only one human condition, and it's the mortal human condition. So what do you – I don't know what you're saying. We, uh, well, my our, point our, was – I think. Yeah, okay. What, what my point was that when Paul quote that? when Paul was writing when Paul was passing on 1 Corinthians 15 that part about the resurrection later on he goes to, on to explain himself and he uses that phrase he doesn't use the word resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15 that's although he does know the word and he uses it anastasis and so when he's using the word egiro and ofthi in a non-physical sense that's my argument which which you can see is a strong argument I support Paul's use of the, Paul's disuse of the word resurrection by pointing out that he also goes on to say that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, the physical body of Jesus that existed before he died, that body yeah. could not I, inherit I, the kingdom of God. I grant that. The, the, the physical body, a physical body cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. That, that is correct. A physical mortal condition. But I would disagree with your usage of that term and the way Paul is using it, because Paul is talking about the moral human condition. And I also don't agree with your, with your argument that Paul does not use anastasis for resurrection. I, I think he does use it in connection with Agiro in 1 Corinthians 15, 12. Um, he says that Christ has risen from the dead. He then uses the Greek word and says, how do you, the Greek word Agiro, and says, how do you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? And he connects that with anastasis with a manner in which Christ rose. How would you then say that he is not using anastasis here? Yeah, because Paul did not write the first part of 1 Corinthians 15. He didn't write those words. Paul had his own theological ideas. But the earliest resurrection account we have was not even written by Paul. It was reported by Paul. And so that okay. very, very earliest account uses non-physical words, just like I would say grandma died and went to heaven. And I, I saw grandma in my dreams. It's that kind of a thing that was going on. It was not... What about, it what was about not, Romans 1.4, Romans 6.5, and Philippians 3.10, where he does say that Christ resurrected from the dead, and he uses the Greek word anastasis to connect the resurrection of his death. Yeah, that was Paul's theology, but that was not the theology of the first resurrection account. Paul was elaborating. So you, you, Paul was theologizing. You, okay, so you at least – I've got one more minute before my cross set stops, and then you can go into your closing. Uh, I just want you to, to make note, you can at least agree that Paul did believe in the physical resurrection of Christ. And if he connects the Greek word anastasis in Romans 1, 4, 6, 5, Philippians 3, 10, and in 1 Corinthians, you can at least agree that he did believe in the physical resurrection of Christ. Am I correct? <clears throat> And, and, yes, but yes, but consider this very important point. Why did he not then use those words in First Corinthians 15? Why did he not I'm say that? that he did, I am he did not. Did. He did I not even write me. that. He did not. Did, did Paul write the first few verses of First Corinthians 15? He said, "I am passing on to you that which I received." He did not write those words. That was an earlier. Christian tradition that did not use the word anastasis or resurrection or bodily resurrection. Historically, if we're trying to get back to the earliest possible account, the earliest possible account that Paul himself did not even write, and Paul himself might have even misunderstood, does not have a bodily resurrection. And you guys, I'm sorry, I really am out of time here. I better we better close up and go and then. Okay, you, yeah, I, you I trust, go ahead and go. Go ahead and go into your closing. No, no problem. I trust, William, you can handle the questions quite handily. You're a very smart and very articulate person. So, um, so yeah. So, um, you can go into your closing. Go ahead. So let me, re let me repeat very quickly that um, the, the question of whether Jesus rose from the dead is not a theological question. It's not an interpretation question. It's not a faith question. It's a historical question. And history, being a, his a tool of science, uh, is limited to natural regularity over time. We do know, 
if we're using the historical method, that continents are not formed on the back of a turtle. We know that, right? And we, it's possible that we, there's something – we weren't there. I mean, it's possible we were wrong. But if, if the continents did actually form on the back of a turtle, the way to know that is not through history. History is the wrong tool. Right, And so when you ask the same question about the resurrection of Jesus, which is an extraordinary account, even more extraordinary than the turtle back, uh, you, you can't answer that question through theology or through interpretations or from what somebody believed by faith. You have to answer you – you can only look at it through history. History has to assume, therefore, that extremely low probability uh, – it's not zero, but an extremely low probability that a dead man who had a bunch of worshipful followers – who, uh, who actually rose from the dead and appeared only to his believers and only to his followers. Uh, and, and that this historical account was only reported maybe 25 years later is the earliest, but 40 years later in the first gospel, during a period of time when we know that eyewitness testimony and human memory is very fallible. In fact, now they're saying in a court of law, eyewitness testimony is some of the worst testimony you could rely on because eyewitness testimony is not that reliable. So uh, we're talking about a historical question. I think... Uh, granted, we do have some evidence, we do have some documents, and we do have theologians who give us all their, you know, very interesting interpretations of theology. But if you're looking at the historical question itself, we have no choice but to conclude that the likelihood that Jesus actually rose from the dead is very, very low. I would put it at 0.005 or something. Uh, I'm not ruling it out. Maybe the miracles happened. But looking at the historical question, uh, we can very confidently say that Jesus did not rise from the dead, at least in any terms that make sense to us. You know, the definition of the word body and the definition of the word dead and the definition of the word, you know, physical. In those basic terms that you and I all live our daily lives in, we can't have any confidence that that actually happened in history. Thanks, you guys. I'm, I'm sorry. To be, I'm not being rude here, but i better, I got to get out of here. So, um, no, no, no problem. Uh, all right. I, I think we. I, I I I appreciate your time, Dan. Okay. Best of luck to you all. We'll we'll, we'll email I, later on then. Definitely. I think we've spoken about uh, perhaps another debate later on. I'll, I'll be in touch with you about that. Let's debate the turtle next time. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Bye. I gotta go. I'll be in touch. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll go ahead and I'll start my closing right right now. Yeah, then. you can do your closing. Just to, uh, and we'll open up the lines for questions. Absolutely. I'll do a quick closing. Okay. Um, I appreciate Dan's time. Uh, unfortunately, I, I don't think Dan made any any points that were, I guess, um, <laughs> historically solid at all. I think um, to answer his, um, his his argument about Paul not using the Greek word anastasis for resurrection, um, Mr. Barker's wrong. Paul uses that Greek word many times, even if, if, if Mr. Barker wants to argue, like he tried to, that Paul didn't write the first portion that he was recounting something somebody else wrote, it, it doesn't matter. Excuse me. It doesn't matter because Paul does use the Greek word anastasis in the latter part of 1 Corinthians, and he uses it in Romans 1, 4, and he uses it in Romans 6, 5, and he uses it in Philippians 3, 10, and guess what? All of these accounts are historically verified accounts, uh, excuse me, historically verified epistles. These are not disputed epistles. These are Pauline. I understand Mr. Barker would argue that Hebrews or 2 Timothy would not be valid, but these are not disputed. These are Pauline epistles. And as if you noticed, if we broaden the list of the other epistles, which I do think are Pauline, the list balloons. Paul frequently used the Greek word anastasis to describe how Christ rose. Adiro, he rose from the dead physically. And Mr. Barker was incorrect with his usage of the Greek word opse for vision. Do, 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 does, is opse ever used for visionary account? Granted, there, there is no argument that opse is used for visionary account, but each time it's used for a visionary, immaterial, symbolic account, we're told that. We're told that. Are you going, are you going to argue with me that in Song of Solomon 2.12, when it says the flowers have already appeared in the land, that you're talking about a symbolic, immaterial appearance? The Greek word opse appears right there. And all throughout the Bible, all throughout the Bible, you have this Greek word. It is used for visionary appearance. I grant that. But we are noted when it is not a physical appearance. 
And when Paul talks about how Christ appeared to him on that road, when he talks about it, he uses physical terms. Because Christ, the resurrected Christ, did appear to him. And the teaching was that Christ resurrected in his spiritual body. Much is made of the Greek word pneumatikos by Mr. Barker. And I'm going to give Mr. Barker a very weird plug here. I know he'll hear my closing <laughs> later on. I'm going to plug Mr. Barker's book, Godless. I want individuals to go out and buy that book and read his, his section of the resurrection. Because if anything, it is going to strengthen your faith. Because the arguments that atheism can put out towards the resurrection of Christ are not good arguments at all. He, much is made of the, the women, perhaps, the, uh, the women at the tomb in the Gospel of Matthew, a contradiction. I, I would recommend everybody read Mark 16.4, Luke 24.2, John 21, and then move on to Matthew 28. And, and you're gonna, you will note how they all connect perfectly. There is nothing that is contradictory here. I disagree completely with what Mr. Barker attempts to say. Going back to the term flesh and blood, Mr. Barker uses that term to, I guess, to perhaps hint or, 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 or imply that this means that Christ could not have risen physically. But when, when, when the terms flesh and blood are used in the Bible, these are for the mortal human condition. That is what is being referred to here. The mortal human condition is what be, is being referred to here. And as Paul tells us in verse 40 of 1 Corinthians 15, Christ was raised in an incorruptible body. An incorruptible body. And, and we didn't even get to go into the early enemies of Christ due to time restraints. And if we go, if we delve into the earliest enemies of Christ, we're going to see We'll see how Celsus, I recommend anybody listening to this debate, go to Google. If you don't own the early church, father, early church Fathers collection, go to Google and look up Origen. In his work, he quotes all of what Celsus says. And it's shocking what, he, what this critic of the resurrection tells us. He tells us this about the resurrection. This was a trick of jugglers. This was a magical trick, he tells us. And, and what is this individual recounting? He's recounting the historical belief in the early 100s and before that the pagans and the Jews believed that Christ must have faked his death. And why, why would he say that the resurrection was a trick? I'll tell you why. Because the resurrected Christ in his physical body was seen by a lot, by a multitude of people. They viewed him, and they were shocked. And the only way to, to, to answer that away was to make the claim that he must have faked his death. But I hate to break it to you. Any individual that is on the cross for multiple hours, any individual that is stabbed the way he was stabbed, even if he would have survived that, he could not have been viewed walking around performing magical acts a few days later. And this is the earliest argument that atheism can, that basically atheism can trot out. He must have been a magician, they say. Well, I'll tell you one thing. He was not a magician. He died brutally on that cross. And he did physically resurrect and I think, I think in, in, in my opening, I wasn't able to get to one of, one of the most amazing things, one of the most amazing things that we do read about the resurrection. And that is, and it's highlighted by John, where he says, destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it. And he spoke of the temple in his body. And I think everything we've seen today, all of the, the most powerful argumentation Mr. Barker could bring forth, I don't think that can answer away the historical truth of the resurrection of Christ. And I will conclude my opening statement at seven minutes, and I will leave way to the, to the phone lines to be open. Thank you. All right, William, thank you so much. And um, I just want to apologize to everybody who's listening. <clears throat> um, 
we have been planning this for months, and um, yes, then we got it canceled, and now it, it. I guess it seems like Dan didn't know it was a two-hour debate, and I just really can't fathom how he didn't know it was a two-hour debate. Um, I think the, the debate went well. I thank him for giving us the time that he spent here, but uh, frankly, I have to apologize to everyone for, I guess, his absent-mindedness or his lack of professionalism, because this is really, really kind of upset me right now. But, you know, we're going to go ahead and discuss some of the issues of the debate, and we're going to open the lines. And if anyone doesn't have anything to say or have any questions or comments, um, I'm going to go ahead and um, and engage William with some of my review and my own opinions of of um, some of the issues of the, about this debate. So the lines Fantastic. are open now. The, num- the number is 347-934-0379. Press 1 if you want to uh, talk to William about some of the issues of the debate. If you have a question, a comment, if you're on the Six Screens Tele Network, um, you can also ask via the Six Screens Network. Uh, and I will I'll just open up that that number. Uh um, um I don't know right now, um John. Right John John's on the video suite and he's asking about when we'll have um him on the debate again. We don't know right now. I'm not sure Yeah, really I don't know even... exactly exactly when, but he did um we did speak and he did want to debate the reliability of the Bible. So we we have been yeah. in communication and, and and we will try to get that down for a future date. Okay, I think I think that might be John right now. Hello, John. Is oh, John. John. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. I just uh, William. This is uh, this is yeah. John Glazy. I just want to say that I've enjoyed listening to your debates. Uh, I Thank find you. you professional. I find you not hateful. I find you uh, funny at times. Uh, and this is coming from an agnostic, <laughs> an agnostic. Oh, wow. Uh, and um, Thank you. I. I think what most what I like about uh, uh, you have a nice way of venting your uh, your comments uh, and uh, whatever. I've listened to most of your debates on Gus's program. Uh, I'm sitting on my uh, debate couch now, uh, <laughs> and because I, I also ask Gus about, aren't you going to be? Uh, won't you be debating this English guy from uh, England or United Kingdom? Isn't there another? There's another guy you debate with, don't you? I think you're referring to, um, oh man, his name is slipping me, and he's he's my friend. <laughs> I'm trying I'm trying to remember his name. Gus, do you remember his name? Yeah, that's him. He's been in this- no one can remember his name. That's him. <laughs> yeah, Robert oh. Stovalls. Hmm? Oh, Robert Stovall. I, 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 yes, I believe you're referring to Robert Stovall. Oh, okay, but that that's it. Uh, you know, uh, and as far as Dan leaving early, that that was not a problem. I mean. Uh, it was an enjoyable debate. You know, you know, you made your your points. You you have different ways of expressing. You, you both of you look at, at at what you're saying at a different uh, viewpoint. Um, but uh, um, I enjoyed it. Okay, let me get back in the live video suite. It's it's a live room. Take care. Thank you very much. Sure. You Likewise, you take care. Hey, John loves all the debate people. He listens to them. Um, yeah, maybe it might be Turrets and Fan. William does have a, a – Turrets and Fan is actually not from Europe, but he will be coming on later on this month. We have an Icons debate with Turrets and Fan. Yes, that is correct. That yeah. is correct. Uh, 989, you're on the air. Oh, yeah. Hello. I just had a short question. Um, if Jesus was – if he was resurrected in the same, you know, physical body – then, then why wasn't he immediately recognized by his disciples? I mean, I know in the account in John when they they saw him, they they thought he was the gardener. So and yeah, that, then, that, you know, that, in the, I think it was at Luke and the road to Emmaus, they didn't recognize him until you know they those weren't the twelve, but they walked with him for quite a period of time. They didn't recognize him until later on. If his body was the physically the same body, it would seem they would have just looked at him and knew it was Jesus. Thank, thank That's you my for question. that question. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a fantastic question. Thank you so much for that. Um, and in answering that, um, 
we need to be clear in what Paul says, and, and perhaps maybe you missed my opening statement, but Paul, when he's talking about the resurrected body, he's talking about our bodies, and then he's, he's making the comparison with how did Christ resurrect? He, he, he's postulating the question, and that he's telling us that the resurrection is going to be like this. Our bodies are made to be in, cor- in corruption, but they're going to be raised in incorruption. Our bodies are made in dishonor. They're going to be raised in glory. So there's one clear thing that we need to make um, noticeable to everybody listening in is that Christ resurrected in a glorious body. We're not talking about the exact same body as when he roamed the earth. We're talking about a glorious body, which is precisely perhaps why, excuse me, perhaps why it was so tough for these individuals to recognize him on the road to Emmaus and perhaps in many other locations as well. Because remember, remember, when Paul talks about the body, he tells us the body that is raised is a spiritual body. And unfortunately, Mr. Barker and a number of other individuals jump on that, and they think, well, you know what? They're talking about a spiritual body. This must be a, um, an immaterial, perhaps a visionary account. But we need to be clear the way Paul uses these terms. He's talking about an actual physical body, and he believed, and it was taught, and I believe that we can – even though we, you know, we can't produce pic, pic, picture evidence, I believe through historical documentation, we can show and we can prove that he resurrected physically from the dead. Hey, um, William, I actually want to um, tackle this a little bit also. I had a guest yeah. on a couple of weeks ago, and I really encourage everyone to listen to that uh, program, Dr. Christopher Kagan. And I think he gives the best explanation for the continuity of the bodily resurrection and yet the difference in a spiritual body. And yes. and this is he gave this this idea. Um and I thought this was really, really excellent. It's the same body and yet changed. That's what we know first Corinthians fifteen says. Correct. Just like yes. when you were a baby, you look different than what you look now, don't didn't you? <laughs> you know, you look different. <laughs> yes. In fact you look, you look different, but you were still the same person. In fact, when you yes. were a teenager, you looked different. I know I looked different from when I was a teenager. Uh, in fact, uh, William, believe it or not, if you, you ever seen William's picture, he's a pretty big muscle-bound guy. He showed me a picture <laughs> of what he looked like before he was a big muscle-bound guy. He was really a real skinny guy. I mean, it's yeah, it believe, was. <laughs> it, it's an incredible transformation. But you can see, you can see the, the the sameness in the way he appeared before, as to the way he looks now. So there's continuity in how he has looked throughout his life lifetime. There's continuity in how I've appeared through my lifetime, and yet I look completely different from when I was a baby, yes. completely different from when I was a teenager, and I, I think. Kagan just, I mean, really hit home run on this. So the the, the spiritual body, and, and we were talking about this in, in the video suite. This is what Paul says. He says it's incorruptible. That means it lacks corruption. Our bodies currently yes. are corrupted. Um, yeah, and I, I think just, 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 just to add. Just, Go ahead. Yeah, I think just to add what you say, Gus, that's such a fantastic point that you're bringing up. And I, I would recommend everybody look up what Augustine says because Augustine says something startlingly, startlingly similar to what Gus is saying. He says that Christ's body, his resurrected body, was gloriously regenerated. And that's such a fantastic way of, of, of talking about the resurrected body. And he goes on and on into how during his time, even during his time, that there's been this chain this chain of historical evidence and belief of eyewitnesses that saw the resurrected body. So, you know, we've got early, we have very early attestation to this. And I think to try and claim to the contrary, I think that's a massive burden that is on the, the non-believer's shoulders. Uh, yeah, I, I, have, I have a pretty good quote here. Um, uh, John of Chrysostom. John Chrysostom, I think he's my last quote I have in the, in the list of quotes I have. In his homily, he says, um, 
he says, he says, one body falls and another body rises again. How then is there a resurrection? <clears throat> For the resurrection is of that which was fallen, but where is that wonderful and surprising trophy over death? If one body fall and another rise again, so he will no longer appear to have given back that which he took captive. And how can the alleged analogy suit the things before mentioned? Why, it is not one substance that is sown and another that is raised, but the same substance improved. And um, I think that really pretty much explains that's, that's, how we did. Yeah, that's, There's that's, some other that's fantastic. Let, let, me, let, me get, let me get some of these other callers. Uh, caller 978, you're on the air. Hello, Augustine. Nine, this is Rick. Can you hear me okay, Augustine? Oh, okay. Yes, yes. This is Rick. Clear. Well, very good. No, really good. Really enjoyed uh, having William Dan on today. It's really time. good they could take some time out of their schedule. Uh, I wanted to ask William a question. I really appreciate, just like John does, he's got a nice, soft, temperate way about him. He's not hostile. And that, that's what you need. When, when, you, when you're debating or you're a Christian man trying to work with another person and showing them truths from the Bible, it has to be done in a nice, even-tempered way. And you, you have that quality, uh, William. That's wonderful. Now, Thank the, you very much. Question, I appreciate that. The, the, the question would be, in John... Uh, 20th chapter 19. I just wanted to get your take on you know the rooms, the doors being locked, and then of course uh, there's different feelings, different thoughts on this passage. How 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 are you taking this that Jesus came through the door? You're talking about John chapter 20 19. Uh, are, are you referring yes. to this in con- uh, Are you referring to this in connection with other verses, or is this pretty much the only verse that you're referring to? Well, the only Cause, verse, cause, cause uh, I, I wanted to get your feeling I, on that. Yeah, because I know that Dan Barker tries to, um, I guess he tries to make a connection, I believe, somewhere in Matthew with this. Um, I, I think that's a really, really good point, and um, a really good question, actually. And, and I'm going to be quite honest with you. It, it's really tough to explain exactly how. You know, I, I mean, I, I don't think I can give you a concrete answer how. I'm going to get the best answer that I can give you. Is, and I think it's the best one that I've encountered, actually comes from um, Athanasius, and I believe Basil as well. Um, they believe that he, I guess I'm trying to look for the exact Greek term that they use. They, they, they don't use a Greek term for spiritual, but they believe that he basically, uh, I'm trying to remember the term, they believe that he, they, they, there was a tradition during their time that Christ was actually not just there, I'm trying to remember. It was something du- du- not dual, something with duo that they used. They they taught that Christ was there as well as in another location, and they used this ber- this verse to prove to further prove his deity when dialoguing with the Arians. And and for the life of me, I can't remember exactly where. But if you give me a few minutes, I will quote that for you. Oh, that's fine. No, it's in fact. I mean, I'm in your camp, and, and certainly I appreciate your thoughts on this. But but it yeah, is kind I, of. I a... wish I had that quote with me. I wish I had it. <laughs> but but I do. I can confirm with you that this whole chain of text, it was used frequently by Athanasius and by Basil. And, and again, I, I I think the one most important part of this verse is where in John, I believe it's verse twenty or twenty one, where he shows him his um, basically his physical wounds. And, and you have them basically, you know, they're looking at his physical wounds. They're, they're seeing the physicality of it. And, and, of course, this leads to this would, I think, connect with, uh, I guess, the, the, the denial of the atheist trying to say that Christ did not resurrect physically. They would claim that this verse is a later legendary account that is being embellished and put in here. But what I find most interesting and it's going to perhaps maybe you can use this later on when dialoguing with other other individuals is that Athanasius and Basil say that this account in John chapter 20, I think it's John 20 all the way to 24, that this account actually had a very, very earlier history than some of the stuff that we read in Mark, Matthew, and Luke, which would in turn eliminate the argument that the atheists like to use that. John is the most legendary of all the Gospels and has the most embellishments. I, I, hope, that, I hope that helps you as best as possible. 
Yeah, no, that's good. No, that's good, William. It's 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 always been. It's a controversial scripture. It's uh, you know some. I mean, I, I've read some commentary on it, and some there's different thoughts on it. Some say the room might not have been locked. You just kind of just pushed through the doors. It's but it, it's interesting. I, I just wanted to bring that up and yeah, get well, your, well, your that, take on it. You know? It's a good question, and and Athena, just to add to that, Athanasius and Basil do not believe that he just pushed through it. They, not, they, they believe that he basically appeared in there, and they argue that he was not just there, but that he was in another location at the exact time performing miracles. Of course, it, it would be impossible to reproduce that in the biblical text, because that is not in the biblical text. But what I find very interesting is that this was an early tradition that they believed. So, uh, again, I think this verse is really important, because what does this verse lead up to? This verse leads up to Doubting Thomas. Who, who proclaims, um, I would argue, clearly proclaims the deity of Christ, where he says, yeah. the, literally, the Lord of me, the Lord of me in the Greek, and the, and the God of me. So yeah. I can see just why Athanasius and Basil would jump on this text. It's, it's a very important text. Yeah, very yeah, good, William. In fact, even 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 in the context of that text, of course, you're right. That's where the hands are, and you know, take a look at my physical hands. So it, 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 it's it's an interesting scripture. And thanks for your thoughts on it. Well, 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 you know, there's a lot of things still that can be thrown on the table, and you can go in a lot of different directions with it. But that is one scripture that does go in a lot of different directions. But thanks for your comment. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Rick. Um, yeah, actually, if I, if I could just uh, touch on that a little bit. I mean, it's it's either of two things or possibly both. One, first of all, we know that Jesus is fully man, and second of all, yes. he's fully divine. So uh, if he's fully divine, he still is omnipresent. Um, and I think that's where you were going with, with Athanasius and Basil. Um, yeah, I, um, I, I but, wish I could remember that word. They, they use a fantastic yeah. Greek word, and I will look yeah. that up. But, yeah, that is exactly what and, they're trying to say. And then, then the other thing is that we don't know what it's like to have an incorruptible, glorified body. I would assume Correct. and assert that an incorruptible, glorified body is um, our bodies to their maximum potential. Uh, that yeah, is correct. And, and 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 to have a body that's able to uh, uh, have maximum potential means it's able to do extraordinary things. And, and we see it happen all the time. I mean, people get adrenaline. They're able to lift a helicopter off of a guy and, and things like that. They have extraordinary strength. Um, but, I mean, yeah. definitely in, in Scripture, somonomatikos, uh, this is a Greek word that used used in First Corinthians 13, which in spiritual yes. body, some translators translate it as supernatural body. And, uh, that would so, be a great, that's a great translation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Supernatural means it, it, it retains its natural elements, but it is improved. What John of Chrysostom said, improved to the point yes. where it is uh, super, almost like we would be supermen, but in, in, in a greater sense, we're able to uh, do not only just lift cars, but defy gravity. Um, definitely, all the things that the angels are able to do, we will be able to do and more. And so um, as partakers of the divine nature, which is another story <laughs> in, in the epistle of Peter. But, uh, yeah, That's I, correct. I think we, we'll be able to walk through walls, and yet we're still material beings. Um, yes. Uh, that's the other explanation I would give. Uh, we have another caller, 830, you've been waiting G, the patiently. String. They, they, they give you a seven string. They give you two G string. Hello, 830? Oh, yes, Hello. Yes. Can you hear me? You've been waiting. Yes. Yes. Oh, all right. How are y'all doing today? You're doing well. great. Awesome. Awesome. So, um, my question is geared towards Mr. Albrecht. Um, call me a skeptic, but I just, you know, I know we're talking about quotes from the Bible and things like that. Uh, my question is um, um, mm. more like, what, Mr. Albrecht, what proof? do you have or could you provide of the actual resurrection, but outside of the Bible? That's kind of more my interest. It's a really good question. Um, And and I'll go right back to what I was talking about in my opening statement and uh, in my rebuttal. And, um, and I'm glad I'm able to finally, (laughs) Gus knows me very well. I I love using the church fathers and I'm so glad I'm finally able to use them a little bit. I, I think if we look outside of the Bible and if we go further down the line in history, if you look at Clement of Rome, 
You look at Ignatius of, of, uh, of Antioch. You look at a number of these individuals, Polycarp, these individuals who were writing, basically they were apostolic fathers. They were taught and they were trained by the apostles, and they're writing directly contemporaneous to these uh, biblical accounts. I think you're going to find, uh, for instance, in, in Ignatius, he tells us, um, and this is in, in Ignatius to the Smyrnians, he says that after, after the resurrection, Christ was still possessed of flesh. After his resurrection, he <coughs> ate and drank with them. He was spiritually united with the Father. And one interesting thing that I do want to point out to the listeners, and it directly connects with what I was talking about with Dan earlier, is Ignatius is connecting the Greek word sarkikos and pneumatikos, fleshly and spiritual. And he's saying that these are physical terms that are being used here. So we've got evidence in these individuals, which these guys were taught by the apostles. Clement of Rome was directly taught by Peter. And I think evidence can also be found in the early enemies of the church. Unfortunately, in my opening, I, I ran out of time. I wasn't able to get – I think there's great evidence in Rabbi Akiva in the early church of, of the famed Bar Kokhba Messianic uh, revolt. And I think there is evidence in, um, in Celsus. I think that he gives great evidence when he talks about the fact that the Jews and the pagans, they can t- attest to having seen the risen Christ – because they say he must have faked his death and that he, after faking his death, he was basically uh, doing magical acts. These magical acts must have been miracles. So, I mean, I think all of that is strong evidence outside of the Bible that Christ must have physically resurrected from the dead. Hope that mm-hmm. helps. Oh, um, yeah. yeah if, I, if I could add, um, and, and, and William just mentioned uh, Clement of Rome. And Clement is actually mentioned by the Apostle Paul in Philippians 4.3, in which I Correct. call the great yes. endorsement. I, I call that the great endorsement because um, when people try to say, you know, well, the apostolic fathers don't have any relation to Scripture, the fact is that um, even though what they wrote is not considered uh, Scripture, they were there being mentored by the apostles, they were eyewitnesses of some of these things. And I think that one of the key elements to um, uh, what William mentioned to Dan and, and, and what, what happens with atheists is that they refuse to accept Scripture as a historical account of what happened. And as long as they yes. refuse to, to view Scripture as history and as just uh, embellished fairy tales, uh, even though scripture mentions actual places, people, and things. Uh, in fact, Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians that, that the, uh, there were over 300 eyewitnesses of Jesus' resurrected body in 1 Corinthians 15. So he's saying, look, you can ask these other 300 people. They saw them too. Um, no, actually, yeah, it was more correct. than it was, it was a, I think it was over, 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 over 500 people. Over 500. Yeah, over 500. Yeah, 500. So, um, here, um, look, look at what Clement hmm. says in his letter to the Corinthians. Ironically, we're talking about 1 Corinthians 15, and um, mm-hmm. he writes in chapter 26, we shall rise again then as the scripture also testifies. It's subtitled that. And he says to this, he says, he says, do we then deem it any great and wonderful thing for the maker of all things to raise up again those who have piously served him in the assurance of a good faith when even by a bird, he shows us the mightiness of his power to fulfill his promise. Um, that might be an allusion to um, uh, a miracle that's actually uh, spoken of in the spirit text about Jesus raising um, two dead birds from the dead when he right, was a young yes, boy. Yes. I remember yeah. that. Yes, I've read that. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's the Gospel of Thomas. For the scripture says in a certain place, yes. you shall raise me up. And I shall confess you. And again, I lay down and slept. I awake because you are with me. And again, Job says, you shall raise up this flesh of mine, which has suffered all these things. So what we see here is a Christian, Clement, who is a bishop in Rome during the first century, during the writings of the New Testament. And he's talking about the Jewish view of the resurrection, which is mentioned in the book of Job. And this is what they hope. See, the, the Christians didn't believe in a spiritualized 
resurrection, like Dan says. They believed in the Jewish resurrection, which was a That's correct. Yep. of the flesh. And I think yes, and we, I, made, I, we can show that, yeah. Yeah, and we can show that right there. Interesting. And there's another one, and Ignatius, uh, in Chapter 3, it's called Christ was possessed of a body after his flesh, and he was the Bishop of Antioch during the days of the Apostles. And he wrote this letter to the Smyrnians, and this is what he says. For I know that after his resurrection also, he was still possessed of flesh. And I believe that he is so now. Here you have a yes. Bishop of Antioch during the days of Paul, um, and he says he believes Jesus still has flesh now, even though Jesus is risen. And then he says, when, for instance, he came to those who were with Peter, he said to them, lay hold, handle me, and see that I am not an incorporeal spirit. I think that throws, yes. that's the nail in the coffin right there. About yeah, what it is. Yes, it is. So uh, this idea that, that and I'm, this is what boggles me about this debate, is Dan claims to be have been a Christian minister for 19 years, and yet this seems to be alien to him, what what he, I mean, he should be familiar with this, and yet, yeah. Uh, so I'm, I don't know. I haven't read the book um, God, the most unpleasant character in all fiction, but I plan on buying the book and reading it. I read Dawkins' book, The God Delusion, so I'm going to read this book because I I want to see, uh, first of all, where what's Dan Barker's um, background as a Christian preacher, and um, what as it pertains to why he doesn't know these things, which are really, I, well, I mean, it's common knowledge in the Catholic Church, but I, I understand some Protestants have um, spiritualized the resurrection, and um, there was a huge... Unfortunately. Unfortunately. Yeah, unfortunately. unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I, we've had this, these problems here at Healing also, and that's why we, I've had to separate with one ministry because of this. But, um, okay, uh, we have another caller, caller 830. You're Hi, on. yes, I have a question for William. And my question is, are there any contradictions in the woman in the tomb accounts? Okay, great, great question. Yeah, that was brought up earlier. Um, Dan brought that up. He brought a... Uh, I think he brought up the account about the number of the women listed, um... He brought up the account of the t- whether the tomb was open already and how many angels appeared there. And no, no, there are no, there are no contradictions there. And um, I'm looking for my notes here. And as, as I think Augustine and the great Athanasius put it best when they point out how, and, and I'm going to go through this real briefly. I know there's not a whole lot of time left, but um, Matthew tells us that Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to the, t- to the tomb as it began to dawn. And then Mark adds Salome to the group and tells us that they came very early in the morning. Luke says the same, that it was very early in the morning, and he names Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women as the, other, as the ones that went to the tomb. John says that Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark. And I think regarding the timing, the timing of the women's trip, some point to an issue being with John 21, 20 verse 1, where he says that they went and it was still dark. So a logical question to pose would be, was it early in the morning, around dawnish, or was it still dark? And, and I'm going to recommend that the – I love bringing up the early church fathers. I love it. I think they were the best apologists and the best theologians. And I'm going to recommend people read Origen and Jerome, as they both point out. And remember, these are both masters of Hebrew and Greek. And they point out that the phrases used in the Gospels all refer to the same time the sky is still dark when the day starts to dawn in the morning. And this wasn't exclusive to these patristic sources, but rather just about anyone that commented on these passages. This was common knowledge even before the scriptures were canonized. And I know Mr. Barker mentioned, well, what about the number of the women listed? Well, we know that five women at least went to the tomb, perhaps more, but we know at least five. Luke tells us three and then says the other women he, he uses the Greek loipot, literally leaving out others besides the three. So notice that Mark does not say that only two women were there. Matthew does not say that there are only two, two women. Mark doesn't say there are only three. 
Instead, they zero in on the women that they actually name. So we don't have any contradictions here. Instead, as would be normal, if, if these individuals are eyewitnesses, which I do believe they were eyewitnesses, I think we can prove it, then you're going to have an, an, an account being told differently from that individual's perspective. But as, if you read them and you read them carefully, none of them contradict the other account. One author may target and may name a certain amount of women, and the other one might only target a few of them, but none of them tell us, oh, you know what, there are only two women. Oh, you know what, there are only three women. None of them do that. We have to be really careful when we're making the argument that these are contradictory because none of them are contradictory. And I think if you read them together, they're like, as, um, as Thomas Aquinas called them, they're a katina, they're a chain. And I think they're a beautiful golden chain that when you read them together, not only do they harmonize, but they bring out the beautiful picture of the resurrection even more perfectly. I, I hope that helps. That's an excellent explanation, William. Hey, William, is, are there much. any books that you want to recommend to our listeners on this particular topic, um, Catholic or Protestant, on the issue of uh, perhaps incons- what you know skeptics say about inconsistencies on the resurrection? Or, uh, yeah, I'm, I, I'm, I'm really going to really one, – one book in, in preparing for this debate, I must have read, I must have read this book at least uh, – four or five times. I recommend, and it comes from different work of his, but you can, if you look it up on Amazon, you can find an incredible compilation of, of Thomas Aquinas on the resurrection. And what, what is incredible about, about this, I'm sure Gus knows very well, is Thomas Aquinas, was, he was a genius. And not only does he talk about the historical uh, accounts of the resurrection, but what he does, he provides us with some quotes that are only able to be found in him that he had of the early church, which are recounting early historical, you know, eyewitnesses, early historical beliefs. And and I would really recommend anybody that would love to get an early historical view on the resurrection. I would, I recommend they go, you can go to Amazon. You can look up Thomas Aquinas on the resurrection. And I'm doing that actually right now as I'm talking to you. It, you can find it, you know, it's relatively cheap. You can probably get it for not even $10. I would definitely recommend anybody get a hold of that book and read it because as, as far as I'm concerned, and, and I know perhaps I'm, I'm in the minority, I'm going to say something that a lot of, a lot, a lot of Catholics and perhaps Protestants uh, might disagree with me with, but I really don't care what modern scholars say about the resurrection. I really don't. I would rather find out what the earliest people to the time of Christ are saying, instead of reading what the Jesus Seminar, guys like John Dominic Cross, who who was a friend of mine, I've spoken with him a a number of times, I would much rather read what an individual like Ignatius or Clement of Rome are talking about in regards to the historicity of the resurrection than read somebody in 2015 or 2014 that are trying to deconstruct what they've already said. So yeah. I would definitely recommend people look that up. I, I think it, it. I think it's fantastic. Yeah, and of course, you know, um, if you read the patristics, you're gonna. I mean, the, the resurrection was 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 attacked right away. And yes. so, if you just read the early church fathers, like what you mentioned, Clement of Rome, I quoted Ignatius of Antioch, uh, Irenaeus against heresies. Um, yeah. the, the, these are all early, early references and defenses of the resurrection of the flesh. And, and, and they use Correct. that term specifically. They're very explicit about the resurrection. Yes. Where we think the Bible is vague, they become very explicit because of the attacks were explicit. And, and so sometimes we have to rise to the occasion. Of course, the resurrection was being debated um, even then, which is why Paul writes First Corinthians 15 by the Gnostics, um, but it becomes even more attacking after the apostles die, and so they become even more specific. But um, Ignatius, of course, existed during the time of the apostles. So did Clement of Rome, who I said is mentioned in Philippians 4.3. Uh, Clement is specifically named in Scripture. Um, the, now, yes. there are some modern apologetic works I would recommend if, 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 
if you don't have a propensity that might have quotes of the early church, especially on the issue with, which um, William just talked about, about inconsistencies. And I would recommend from, it's called When Skeptics Ask by Dr. Norman Geisler and Ron Rhodes. And, and ironically, William, Dr. Norman Geisler, he's a Protestant, but he is a Protestant who, who um, follows Aquinas uh, in great detail. In fact, um, oh really? He's, yeah, he's he's a, a huge fan of Thomas Aquinas. In fact, he's been criticized as being too Catholic because he follows Aquinas. <laughs> so yeah, and, um, he actually, and to add to that, he got his PhD yeah, from a Catholic university, actually. So um, yeah, and, yeah. Um, I do want to add one modern book. I do, I do. Be, be, before we run out, run out of time, um, I, and I've spoken with this individual a number of times. He, he's, he's a good friend of mine. And I'm pretty sure a number of people uh, uh, know who N.T. Wright is. Um, yeah. he's, a, he's a great author. I spoke, in fact, leading up to this debate, I, I had a number of conversations with him. And um, e- even though we don't agree on everything, you know, he's not, he is not a Catholic. Uh, I think N.T. I think Wright is an incredible author, incredible theologian, and I think he puts yeah. forth a great account of the resurrection. I think anybody, you got to get that book. <laughs> you know, it's a massive book, but... Look up N.T. Right. Wright and his resurrection of the Son of God. You're going to love it. So, yeah, I, I'm actually going to be ha- I'm going to be having two other guests in the future in May and in July on the topic of the resurrection. Dr. Gary Habermas, who is a if, – if, if, when it comes to the resurrection – He's the best. He's the best. Yeah, <laughs> Habermas and, and, uh, and Norman Geisler, uh, who wrote a book called The Battle for the Resurrection – um, and there's a new edition of that book. But um, Geisler and Habermas are the two, I mean, premier Protestant authorities on dealing with the resurrection. And Ron Rose understudied um, with Geisler on that issue, and I'll be having him in July. Um, so, you know, yeah. this is a really important topic. We're down to the last three minutes of the program. Uh, if anybody's going to hit one, hit it now. You know, as I say, you know, speak now or, for, you know, forever hold your peace. Um, <laughs> yep. So we're down to the last three minutes. Uh, I want to, first of all, despite um, Dan Barker's uh, quick exit, I want to thank him for uh, the time that he spent here. It was valuable in many, many ways. It was a really, really good debate uh, as long as it went. I hope that um, he can stick here for the whole two hours on the next debate that they will plan, possibly. Yeah. And, uh, and I do want to let everyone know that William does have another debate later on this month. It will be the last Saturday of this month on the issue of icons. That's a Catholic-Protestant debate with Turretin yes, fans. that's correct. Turretin, Turretin fan is, is – uh, he hails from Alpha and Omega Ministries and Dr. James White's ministry. And he, he doesn't live far from me. He lives in Virginia. So um, we're, we're, we're kind of close up. Uh, we've had several debates with Turretin fan and William. They always conducted well. They're very professional, and uh, I always love to have, hear them. So that ends today's broadcast. Let everyone know next week we're going to have a retelecast. And it will be Cheryl and Cheryl and Niles Chansma, who served at the Watchtower headquarters. Um, they're old school former Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, served during the Nor years, and so that's a retelecast. It's going to be two hours. You're going to really enjoy that. Cheryl and Niles Chansma. And then um, the next two weeks, I'll be trying to get some guests. But um, uh, we do have, at the end of this month, a solid debate going on. And so uh, I want to thank everyone tomorrow, the Sunday dinner at 6 o'clock. 6 uh, o'clock. 6 o'clock p.m. Eastern time. Tomorrow, Sunday dinner. Um, I've been having it at 6.30, but I noticed there's a half an hour gap, and so I'm going to have it at 6 tomorrow. I think we're going to change the time to 6 unless um, it needs to be pushed to 6.30. But um, I want to thank everyone. Tomorrow Sunday dinner is going to be on the attribute of God is jealous, and he is a judge, and also death in the afterlife. So be tuned in tomorrow, and you can listen to the rest of this day on six screens. If you're listening right now via Blog Talk Radio, you want to hear more about the cult, dial in now to 712-432-8710.
and dial in when prompted, 9925. So you all have a blessed weekend. See you tomorrow at the Sunday dinner, and that will be on the video suite and here on Blog Talk Radio. You all have a great day. Bye-bye.